35. Today is Palm Sunday. Uh, it's been rebranded Virgin Marathon Palm Sunday, I think. <laughs> um, and uh, we're also uh, coming to the end of our series on spiritual warfare. So trying to bring together kind of like spiritual warfare and Palm Sunday and the marathon. And we had this idea that I think uh, Rod was going to dress in uh, camouflage combats and carry a donkey down the highway run, running for the marathon, but uh, he wasn't too keen on that, and there were issues with the donkey's safety, apparently. Um, but anyway, so that, that came to nothing. Um, so uh, we are going to start with Palm Sunday, uh, and we're going to start with uh, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, which is what the church remembers today as we start with Holy Week and uh, all the events that led up to the cross and the resurrection. So Matthew chapter 21, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up and asked, Who is this? Who is this? God is coming. The first Palm Sunday is just before Passover, and Jesus has been making his way to Jerusalem. And as they approach Jerusalem, as Jesus and his disciples approach Jerusalem, Jesus begins to make arrangements. He begins to send them ahead to sort things out. He wants to enter Jerusalem in the right way. He wants to enter Jerusalem in a way which tells people exactly who he is. He wants to enter Jerusalem in a way that lets people understand exactly what is going on that day. He wants them to understand that what is happening is exactly what the prophet Zechariah wrote about 550 years earlier. He wants them to get that, that that prophecy is coming true right in front of them. And Zechariah writes... Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He continues, the Lord their God will save his people on that day, as a shepherd saves his flock. So Jesus goes into Jerusalem on a donkey, not just to show humility, although it is an act of humility, but he also wants people to get that Zechariah, Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, was writing about him, that he is the word of God happening right in front of their eyes that day. And Zechariah says, your king is coming to you. And Jesus wants people to know that he is the coming king, that he is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. Zechariah says, your king is righteous and has salvation. And Jesus wants them to know that he is coming with salvation. He is coming to rescue people. He is coming to set people free. And Zechariah says, the Lord your God will save you on that day, like a shepherd saves his flock. And Jesus wants people to know that as he comes into Jerusalem, that this is the Lord God coming to save his people. And Jesus is saying to the crowd, and he's saying to us, God is coming. God is coming, and he's coming with freedom. He's coming to set us free. He's coming with freedom. How do we respond? How do we respond? Well, three ways. First of all, with yes, but on my terms. Secondly, with no, back off. Or thirdly, with yes, I trust you. Three ways that we can respond. So first of all, yes, but on my terms. God's coming and offering freedom. How do we respond? Yes, but on my terms. 
The crowd are shouting. They're shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. So they get that Jesus is the son of David. They get that Jesus is David's son, and that must mean that he's the king of Israel. They get that. They say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's a line from Psalm 118. It's a victory psalm, celebrating God's victory over the pagan nations. And that tells us that they have a very clear idea of what their rescue looks like. It tells us that they have a very clear idea of what their freedom looks like. That they're expecting a military messiah. They're expecting someone to come and defeat the Romans, to throw them out, to make Israel an independent kingdom again, to restore the former glory of God's people again. And there's a few problems with that. Not least of which, the former glory of God's people is never as as glorious as we actually remember it. But secondly... Zechariah and the other Old Testament prophets are clear that the coming king who's coming to bring freedom is not only going to be the king of Israel, he's going to be the king over all of God's people. He's going to be the ruler of all the nations of the earth. And that means that he wants to be king of all of the people that are in Jerusalem that day. He wants even the Romans to come under his rule. He wants everyone who's there to come into his kingdom. And we've seen Jesus as he goes around during his ministry, inviting Roman soldiers and inviting Gentiles and inviting Samaritans, people that you wouldn't expect to come into his kingdom and to put their trust in him. So the crowd is saying, yes, but on our terms. Yes, but on our terms. And that's been my response for quite a lot of my life. Yes, but on my terms. And for some of us, that's our response. You know, we say, yes, I want the freedom that you're offering. But I want to hold on to this stuff over here. Yes, I want you to deal with my enemies and the things that are bothering me. But I want to carry on feeling superior to those people that I don't like or to that person that I don't get on with. Yes, I want you to set me free, but I want to do with my money whatever I choose. Yes, I want you to set me free, but I want to keep those sexual relationships that I enjoy. Yes, I want you to set me free, but I want to keep my political views unchanged. Yes, but. And that's what the crowd is saying. That's what the crowd is saying. We want this kind of Messiah but not this kind of Messiah. We want Jesus to be this kind of king, but not this kind of king. We want want him to set us free from this stuff, but not from this stuff. Yes, but is basically no. And this crowd, you know, they're saying yes, but, and in a very few days, they're going to be shouting for Jesus to be crucified. Yes, but is often basically No. So the second response, no, back off. You know, you could just say no, back off. That's the response of the priests and of the Jewish leaders. In verse 23, they they say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? They've got it absolutely right. They've recognized what's going on when Jesus comes into Jerusalem on a donkey. They've recognized what he's doing when he deliberately sets things up so that the prophecy from Zechariah is fulfilled. They've recognized what's happening. He's making a claim to authority. He's making a claim to be king. He's making a claim to be the one person in charge of everything. And more than that, and this is really offensive, he's saying that when he's claiming authority, that actually it's God's authority He's saying that when he takes charge and assumes control, it's God assuming his rightful place as king. And that's as offensive today as it was back then. It was offensive back then because everyone knew that the Roman emperor was in charge. Everyone knew that even the chief priests in the temple had to have the emperor's permission before they could take up their jobs. Everyone knew that Herod and the rulers of the Jewish people had to have the emperor's permission to take up those jobs and those roles. 
And it's offensive today because everyone knows that basically I'm in charge of my own life. That no one can tell me what to do. That I've got every right to all of my opinions, all of my decisions, all of my actions. And I decide who gets to be in charge of me and how much they get me to tell. And no one else. And certainly not God. And Jesus shows up and he says, you want to be set free? That's great. That's great. Just let me sort this out for you. And some people say, no, back off. And that's what the priests and the Jewish leaders are saying here. So Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And the crowd says, yes, but on our terms. And the priests and the leaders say, no, back off. And then there's this third response, the response of the disciples. Yes, I trust you. Yes, I trust you. So as Jesus enters Jerusalem, the first thing that we notice is that the disciples are very quiet. We don't hear a lot from them. Jesus isn't talking to them very much. You know, for, 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 for a long time, he's just been teaching them, and we've been hearing him talk to them. Now he's talking to the Pharisees, he's talking to the temple authorities, he's talking to the crowds, but he's not talking to the disciples. We don't hear much from them, but we know that they're listening. We know that they're watching. We know they're going to be writing down their accounts, and we're going to be able to read them. They're seeing what Jesus is doing. They're looking at what he's saying. They're following him. They're going where he sends them. When he says, go and prepare this room, go and fetch this donkey, go and find this person. And they're asking questions. Jesus, how did this happen? Jesus, what does this mean? Jesus, when will these things take place? And this is what trust looks like as it starts to take hold of our lives. This is what faith looks like as we start to lean in on it. Listening, watching, following, looking for the next small thing that we can do for Jesus and the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. Who is the person that we can share that verse from Scripture with that we were so excited about? Who is that person that we can invite to Alpha? Who is that person that we could bring along to our Connect group? Who is that neighbor that we could invite round for a meal or to a barbecue? Who is that person that we could bring along to an acoustic night in the pub? Yes, I trust you with that, Jesus. Yes, I trust you with that, Jesus. And that, and that. One step, one decision, one action at a time. And faith takes hold of us more and more and more. So Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And he's coming with God's offer of freedom. And within a week or so, he's going to be nailed up to a Roman cross. And this is the price of the freedom that he brings. This is the battle that he's come to fight against the forces that want to keep us not free, but the forces that want to keep us slaves, the forces that want to keep us trapped, the forces that want to keep us fearful and addicted and chained up. And this is the victory that Jesus is going to win. This is the victory that he is going to fight for. This is how God's people are going to be set free. This is how it's going to be possible for us to say, we trust you, because he's going to win that battle on the cross. It's a battle against Satan. It's a battle against sin and death and all of the true enemies of the human race. It's a battle which all of the disciples run away from, which we run away from so often. But Jesus fights it alone. And he wins. And he's raised from death and he's shown to be ripe. And his claim to be king is seen to be true. And his claim to have God's authority is demonstrated in power. And all of the disciples have deserted him, except one. 
except one. And that's the closest friend of Jesus, a man called John. And John saw Jesus ride into Jerusalem. He saw Jesus crucified. He stood at the foot of the cross while Jesus was crucified. He saw him risen from death. And John is writing this vision for the churches, the vision, the reading that we heard uh, from Susan. Um, He's writing that vision for the churches. He's writing it for us. Sixty years after Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Sixty years have passed. And the good news about the freedom that Jesus won on the cross is spreading throughout the world. But it's also a hard time for the church. So people are saying no to Jesus' offer of freedom. They're saying no, back off. And those guys, now they're persecuting the church. They're killing the followers of Jesus. And Jesus wants to encourage the church whenever we get attacked for following him. And other people are saying yes, but, in the way that the crowd were saying yes, but, and the church at that time is compromised. You know, there are people in the church taking part in pagan orgies, the equivalent of internet porn at the time. There are people engaged in false teaching, uh, not faithful to God's character. And Jesus wants to lovingly correct the church when it's gone off course. And there are other people saying, yes, Jesus, I trust you. And John is given this vision. He's given this prophecy, this vision, this picture to encourage the church to build up Christians so that we can know Jesus better, so that we can trust him more, so that we can follow him more faithfully, so that we can know that the freedom that he offers comes with a guarantee. He says... I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose riders called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe, dripped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. King of Kings. And Lord of Lords, say it with me, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Heaven is standing open and John sees Jesus as he will be when he comes back. He sees Jesus after the cross, after the resurrection, after he's ascended to the throne of heaven. He sees Jesus at the end of the age and Jesus is about to finally defeat Satan and the powers and the people who've lined up behind him. And this last battle hasn't taken place yet, but its outcome is certain. The outcome is secure, because Jesus has already won the victory on the cross. And so Jesus goes into battle when he comes back as if he's already won, because he has already won on the cross. So we read, on his head are many crowns, because he rules over all of the kingdoms of the world. We read he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, because he's already won the victory at the cost of his own blood. And the people who are following him, they don't need the full armor of God anymore. They're wearing fine white linen to show that they're clean and perfect and restored and new. And Jesus, we're told has a name that no one knows. And a name in the Bible uh, isn't just what you decide to call someone. It's it's about someone's character. So Jesus in this passage uh, isn't called uh, Jesus. Jesus means the Lord saves, and he's already done that on the cross. So he's not called Jesus here. We're told he's given a new and different name, and what that means is there'll be aspects of his character that we'll only understand when he comes back. What that means is there'll be questions that we might have about Jesus that we will only get answered when we see him come back in power. 
And John sees this vision. And he's given this vision to encourage the church, to encourage us. Because we weren't all around to see Jesus risen from the dead, but we will all be around to see him like this. To see him in victory as he comes to mop up at the end of the age. And John paints this picture for us of the final defeat of all of the enemies of God in grim and gory detail. The enemies of God defeated so that the people of God can be set free. The enemies of God defeated so that we can be who we're meant to be. The enemies of God defeated so that Jesus can come into everything that he's supposed to be because defeat means that Jesus' kingdom is going to be finally established over the whole earth. He's going to be king over the whole earth. His rule, his government, his sovereignty is going to be total. It's going to be absolute. It's going to be complete. It's going to be perfect. It's going to be amazing. And John sees Jesus on a white horse leading God's people into that kingdom, leading us into that kingdom, striking down Satan and sin and death and every evil that might get on the way as he leads us home to the new creation. And I'm really excited about that. And his name, which we'll only fully understand when we see him, his name is the Word of God. The Word of God. And God's Word comes out of his mouth like a sword. It's who Jesus is. It's how he defeats evil. It's how he builds up his people, the word of God. It's his name. It's his character. It's his personality. He's the embodiment of God's word. When he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, That's what he wants people to know, that he's the word of God coming true, being made real in front of them. It's everything that he is. And it's how he'll rule the earth as the word of God, who is king of kings and lord of lords. And this is the Jesus that we're asked to trust today. And we can make our small steps of faith and trust because he has won the main battle we're living out of his victory and if we want to get to know him we can find out who he is because his name is the word of God his name is the word of God and that means this book is all about Jesus. This is the word of God written, and it's about Jesus from beginning to end. The word of God is Jesus leading us, his people, in victory procession when he's defeated all of our enemies. The word of God is Jesus speaking to us through the Holy Spirit in this book, which is our weapon and our defense and our encouragement now and until Jesus comes back. The word of God is Jesus, God coming to set us free. And John says, I saw heaven standing open. And whenever we open this book, heaven stands open. And God speaks to us from heaven and we can see Jesus for who he is today we can see him for who he has been we can see him for who he's going to be forever and into eternity and it's because we can know him in that way we can know his character we can know who he is we can know what he's won for us that we can say yes yes I trust you. Yes, I trust you. Yes, I trust you. Shall we stand together?